Hey everyone and welcome back to the Linux and open source news. This week we have a weird one as we have some Russian based maintainers being removed from the Linux kernel but the matter this was done and how was communicated in probably the worst way possible. We also have a seemingly unhinged laptop reseller accusing the core boot project of basically being corrupt after they failed themselves to port core boot to various laptops that they sell. And we have some drivers being shipped as snaps and a bunch of other things. And we also have this message from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Chasm Workspaces. It's a great project for streaming applications or operating systems or desktops straight to your browser. They just released version 1.16, which adds support for deployment to Kubernetes using Rancher, Harvester, and Kubevert to allow you to run Chasm in your Kubernetes cluster via a Helm chart. Additional updates include managed egress through OpenVPN and WireGuard, per workspace progressive web apps and new images for Chasm OS and Ubuntu Noble. You can try it out in your home lab today. The Chasm Workspaces Community Edition can be self-hosted or you can also access it as a software as a service subscription. All the links are as usual in the description. Click them to learn more about Chasm. Okay, so several Linux kernel maintainers were removed from the project this week, specifically from the maintainers file that identifies who can send patches straight to the kernel without being sponsored or reviewed by someone else first. The only reason given at the time was that these maintainers didn't fit compliance requirements and that they can come back in the future if sufficient documentation is provided but people were quick to notice that all of these maintainers appeared to come from Russia, working for Russian companies and using .ru email addresses. And so Torvalds answered in a pretty petulant manner. He said he will not discuss legal issues with random internet people, most of which he apparently suspects to be paid actors or people riled up by paid Russian trolls, which is probably not the answer a lot of concerned people were expecting. He also said that the various compliance issues aren't specifically linked to the US, but that there are in the world currently Russian sanctions that are enforced in a lot of places. He also says that he's Finnish and that there is no chance in the world he would ever support Russian aggression because, well, if you have any notion of history, Finland had to contend with Russians' invasions quite a few times at great cost. After this answer didn't go down too well with people, a kernel developer called James Bottomley apologized for the way that this was handled and clarified that anyone employed by a company listed on the US OFAC list and that is therefore subject to OFAC sanctions is simply no longer eligible to be in the maintainer's file and their collaboration is currently restricted. James also said that they're really sorry that it has come to this, but that most of the Linux infrastructure and most of its maintainers are located in the US and they can't ignore the requirements of US law. They also hope that they won't need to go as far as removing specific patches written by all of these maintainers. They have lawyers looking at that and that's why it took so long to clarify all of this because lawyers are apparently still evaluating things, discussing what exactly they need to do and they're also working on a policy document for future similar issues. Now, hopefully this clarifies the situation a little bit and calms things down. It's not a perfect answer and it's not great. And I'm sure a lot of people will paint this as open source is dead or Linux is now controlled by the US. But that's just nonsense. It's always been like that. Even if you're an individual developing code on your own or if you're a company or a nonprofit, you have to work from one specific country and all the laws of that country apply to you and your project, even if it's not a business and even if it's not making money. It's always been this way. And anyone thinking that it has ever been different for free and open source project is completely confused and deluded. It also sucks that these sanctions aren't applied equally to all regimes currently engaged in war and in killing civilians and in using war material. But that's the world currently. Unfortunately, all companies, organizations and individuals can do is follow the law where they're based. 
they just don't have a choice if they don't want to be closed down. Now, our second topic of the day will be something I didn't write about last week because I felt I didn't know enough to talk about it, uh, but since then more info has surfaced and I can clearly explain this issue. This came to me last week in a press release from Malibal. It's a company like Tuxedo or Slimbook. Uh, they make computers running Linux or they rebrand certain computers, do some testing and presumably also contribute some code like Tuxedo, Slimbook or System76 do. Except Malibal seems based in the US and is apparently just one person and this company wanted to bring core boot to some of their laptops. Tried working with multiple companies based in Poland, Germany and Texas to bring that to their customers. Except the story then gets pretty ridiculous because Malibal felt that these companies charge too much for porting core boot to their boards, at which point they said that they would do it themselves. And as always happens in these cases, they hit a snag and they had to contact these companies to try and make things work. They seemed to think they had a completely working code base that only needed debugging, but apparently none of the companies they reached out to agreed. And they basically all said that they had to do all the work. What Malibal had wasn't even the beginning of what was needed to get Coreboot running. In the following month, Malibal seems to have alienated all of these companies or individuals one by one by asking them to work for way lower rates than what they offered and by seemingly treating them like crap. As each of these companies closed their doors to Malibal, the company decided to no longer ship any of their products to any country from which one of these companies operated. So they banned Germany, but also Austria and Liechtenstein. They also banned Poland and they banned the entire state of Texas, because I guess banning the US would have meant they would have sold zero units uh, each year. To complete things, they also banned all AMD CPUs and GPUs from their products because an independent contractor rubbed them the wrong way and he was employed by AMD. Malibar then contacted a bunch of Linux-focused websites and YouTubers, myself included, trying to break this story on how Coreboot was crap and unethical and they gouged people, uh, but reading Malibar's account, the thing they wrote themselves, clearly paints Malibal in the worst light possible and makes them look like they are the problem. Frankly, the person who wrote all of this account seems a bit unhinged. It has echoes and, and turns of phrase that really remind me of all you can read on conspiracy theories online. It's that sort of level. Uh, Jeremy Soller from System76 even commented on the thing just saying that it was a skill issue, which resulted in Malibal also banning the state of Colorado because Jeremy Soller works for System76 and they're based in Colorado. Not the reaction of a regular, normal, sane human person, I guess. The whole account seems to paint Malibal as a company that just wanted to not pay enough for the work and just thought it would be very easy when it really truly wouldn't be and they just had to pay the developers to get it working. And in the end, they thought people were out to get them or, or that it was a, a conspiracy on the core boot side or whatever else. Now, there was an interesting thing on packaging formats this week as Intel's NPU driver was released but on the Snap Store, as a Snap package. This driver is what gives you the device firmware, a user space driver and compiler, and an application to validate all of that so that you can use Intel's latest coprocessors to work with AI-related stuff. These are uh, little processors, uh, NPUs, that are included in recent uh, versions of Intel CPUs. Where things are interesting isn't with what the driver does, because, well, it is a driver. At some point, it will likely be upstreamed on the Linux kernel and the firmware will land in the Linux firmware package. What's interesting is the fact that snaps allow you to distribute drivers in a distro agnostic way that doesn't require a recompiled kernel, a package for your version of your distro or anything else. Flatpak, as far as I know, can't really do that. So that's definitely one of snaps advantages. Some might say it's the only one. Now it also has practical applications though, because this driver is currently in beta. 
Usually, no one would really be able to test it, apart from people willing to compile their own kernel with this driver patched in or added, or using a repo made specifically for their distro, with the driver being provided as an external module with DKMS, for example. Here, it is a quick and painless graphical install in one click, which is pretty nice. At least for people who have a recent enough CPU to be able to access that NPU and people who actually want to use that NPU to run some AI tasks, which is definitely not my case. But some people might want that. And so that's a nice advantage of Snaps, being able to distribute drivers and basically any layer of the operating system can be packaged as a snap, which is not the case for other packaging formats like flat packs and others. It's still an interesting thing to follow and this is what Ubuntu will base itself to build their Ubuntu core desktop, their immutable distro that is exclusively packaged as snaps, including the kernel, the desktop environment, the applications and everything, all of which will just be a layer of a snap package. Now, despite the current financial issues going with the GNOME Foundation, the Sovereign Tech Foundation projects are still ongoing because these were funded independently of the main foundation's budget. And this now resulted in a first implementation of the USB portal for Flatpak. This is obviously still in development, but it lets apps request access to specific USB devices, and users can grant this permission on a per-app, per-device basis, meaning it's no longer granting the entire permission to access all of the devices to any specific app. There's a lot more granularity, and USB devices are now isolated from the permissions set for other devices that the system might have. The notifications portal also received a big update, now adding support for notification sounds, for markup text in the body of a notification, for notification grouping, and more. The end goal of this thing is to unify all notifications under this specific portal that should work for all desktop environments. There's also been some interesting work on the compositor of GNOME, Mutter. In the next version of GNOME, it should be able to give you significantly better performance when using a secondary GPU to output to an external monitor, notably with NVIDIA GPUs, but not exclusively. And it's really nice to see this thing being improved and fixed. This is also what NVIDIA said that they wanted to work, uh, having a common infrastructure for all Linux drivers at the Linux kernel level to handle all of this. Uh, because currently, if I do this kind of stuff, my frame rate is cut in half and it sucks. Of course, this is for GNOME. I currently use KDE. But honestly, if this works well when I test the next version of GNOME and KDE doesn't have that, I might just switch to GNOME just for that. It's that important to my workflow. Now, speaking of drivers, we have an update to the NVIDIA beta drivers that looks pretty good in terms of Linux support. First, this new beta for drivers version 5.65, the current stable version being 5.60, it will bring back some extensions used by X Wayland now that bugs that prevented these extensions from working properly are fixed, meaning X Wayland performance on Nvidia will get better. This driver update also includes an optimization to improve performance in certain DirectX 9 games running through DXVK. There's also new properties exposed by the driver that Wayland compositors can use to enable HDR support and the entire color management pipeline that KDE and GNOME and others have been working on. Plenty of bugs also received fixes, including bugs that prevented suspend and resume, some performance regressions when playing DirectX 12 games with VKD3D, and more. And it is going to take some time before people give NVIDIA the time of day on Linux or even just a second chance. But you have to remember, back when I started using Linux, Nvidia were the ones who had the solid open source drivers. It only started changing with the end of the GTX line and the early RTX with the GSP, the GPU system processor. Before that, Nvidia drivers on Linux were better than AMD's. AMD relied on FGLRX, which was a proprietary driver that barely functioned and caused a lot of issues for everyone. The worlds were reversed, and they can reverse again at some point, or at least Nvidia can catch up to AMD again. And this is currently what we're experiencing. 
Now let's move on to gaming. There was a big update to SteamOS this week. Version 3.6 was released. It's been in testing since May, so it's taken a long while for Valve to make sure that things worked right. Steam Deck users can expect driver updates because the system will be moving to Mesa 24.1, which should boost performance for a bunch of titles. There's also a newer Linux kernel, version 6.5, which will give better hardware support, but should also improve the desktop mode. But this desktop mode is still stuck on Plasma 5.27.10. It doesn't move to Plasma 6 still after almost a year of this version being out, which kinda sucks. The SteamOS UI should also work a bit faster and more smoothly, boot times are presumably improved as well, and the display of your Steam Deck should have more uniform lighting and color. This is what they call Mura compensation, it's something I didn't know about at all, but it seems to affect a lot of OLED panels, and this is what causes a grainy image effect, uh, so this should be fixed or at least uh, toned down on the Steam Deck OLED. The color balance should be much better with low brightness levels as well. Apparently the screen could tint a bit on the green side uh, when lowering the brightness and this should no longer happen. There's a lot of work on inputs as well, notably with SteamOS now better supporting the ROG Allies special keys, because Valve is still trying to port SteamOS to other handhelds, or at least to offer a suitable replacement for Windows on these handhelds, probably in the long-term goal of opening SteamOS to everyone, but this still hasn't happened after a few years, so hopefully it happens sooner rather than later. Steam Deck LCD owners can also look forward to 10% better battery life in light load scenarios due to a BIOS update, so probably a tweaking of the power consumption, the power modes, and the fan curves. As per the Steam Deck dock, it now supports some HDMI CEC features, meaning you can wake up the TV and automatically switch to the Steam Deck dock's input when turning the Steam Deck on and plugging it into its dock. So this is a pretty big update for Steam Deck owners, whether you have the OLED or the LCD model, Personally, I'm looking forward to that 10% battery life improvement because I only play not very demanding titles on the deck and that 10% increase could amount to about 30 minutes to 45 minutes of uh, more gameplay before a charge, which is always better to see. But if you have the OLED, you're probably happy about the color calibration and reduction of the graininess of the display. That's probably good for everyone. Just like it's always good to have a device from today's sponsor, Tuxedo Computers. You all know about them by now, I've been talking about them at the end of my videos for more than two years, which shows how dedicated I am to showcasing their products. They're really good, they're computers that ship with Linux out of the box, laptops, desktops, you decide. They have a wide range of devices, you can configure most of the components inside, you can have your own custom keyboard layout, your own logo laser etched on your laptop, and they will basically fit every price point and every need, and you know that their computers run Linux really well because that's the point of the entire thing. I only use their devices these days. My entire channel, my podcast, my videos, everything is run from one of their laptops and all my gaming needs are served from one of their desktops. So if you need a new computer, you need to run Linux on it and you want to support a company that actively contributes to Linux support for hardware, click the link in the description below and get yourself something from Tuxio. They're really, really good. Okay, so thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, you know what to do. All these nice YouTube buttons are underneath the video. Click them all, leave a comment, whatever else for the algorithm. You know how things work. If you really enjoy the channel and if you'd like a daily version of these news episodes, you can also get that. Just click one of the links to Patreon or YouTube memberships in the video descriptions. Starting at $1 a month, you can get all of that and more. In the meantime, thank you all for watching and I guess you will see me in the next one next week. Bye!